Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Payson System stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or sell. Payson is a Canadian energy services and technology company. It develops and delivers hardware, software and services primarily for the oil and gas drilling industry in 12 countries. We're going to look at the ticker that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange, so all the numbers are in Canadian dollars. But the company also trades in the United States over the counter. The ticker is PSYTF. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 753 million market cap. They're trading at $9 a share and they have 83 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company does have positive and pretty consistent free cash flow each year. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's a revenue minus expenses. And they also have positive net income each year. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that's not doing so well. It was $246 million in 2017, but only $192 million in a trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The difference between those two numbers is their gross profit, and that was the lowest in a trailing 12 months due to low revenue. Below that is operating expenses, and then below that is operating income. At least the company does have positive operating income each year. The bottom line of the income statement is their net income, and that was the lowest in a trailing 12 months at 19 million. It peaked in 2018 at 62 million. The reason the company had much lower revenue in a trailing 12 months was due to a decrease in drilling, but they do expect this to turn around in 2021. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus capex gives you your free cash flow. And that was positive every year, and it's pretty consistent. The company didn't issue any debt in the past four years. It did pay down two and a half million of debt in 2019, and two and a half million in a trailing 12 months. It issued 7 million of capital stock, 11 million, then 3.4 million. But it repurchased much more capital stock, 24 million in 2019 and 17 million in a trailing 12 months. So it appears that this company is generating enough cash to run its business. It does not need debt and equity financing. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. And this company does seem to be generating a sufficient amount of operating cash flow. 86 to 110 million dollars a year. The way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income and then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. We have to add back 37 million dollars depreciation, 3.5 million of stock-based compensation. There was also a 39 million dollar increase in changes in working capital. So even though the company reported 17 million dollars of profit, they actually generated 86 million dollars of cash flow. Net income is accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. You need to look at the statement of cash flows to see how much cash they generated. Let's look at the capital structure. $346 million of equity, $15 million of debt. They're 96% equity, 4% debt. And their WAC is pretty high, 17.5%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 779 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using a weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $640 million. We divide that by 83 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $7.70. They're trading at $9, so they're trading at an 18% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is much lower than me. They value the stock at 131 a share. They're saying it's really overvalued. The stock was trading over $20, but it took a huge dip the last six months. The stock is a lot closer to my valuation, 
but it's way off from simply Wall Street's valuation. In the third quarter of 2020, the company cut its dividend to $0.05 cents from $0.19. Cents. With the lower revenue, they have less cash coming in, so they're trying to conserve cash. This is a really good strategy. Their dividend yield is 2.2%, and they pay out 87% of their net income, 22% of their free cash flow. The company does have a high beta, 2.01. The stock moves more than two times the market. That's why they had such a high whack. And the stock has gone down 31% in the past 52 weeks, much worse than the S&P 500. And the lowest $5, the high was 14. The stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. And only about 250,000 shares are traded each day for this stock. And almost all the shares outstanding are on float. 82% of the shares are held by institutions, and only 1.29% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $6,600 today. If you did not reinvest the dividends, you'd have $7,500 today. And if you did invest $10,000 10 years ago, you could have sold at over $20,000 at its peak. But if you're still holding on, you'd be down money. FMR holds 14% of the company's stock, then Burgundy Asset Management, then Kane Anderson, then McKenzie Financial, and last is Royce & Associates. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 11.2, the median is 14.5, PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 39.3, so investors are paying $39 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 3.9, so they're between the median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 2.2. They're better than the median and average. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in a balance sheet. And they have $346 million of equity, $300 million of tangible equity, since they have $51 million of intangibles on their balance sheet. 33 million of goodwill and 17 million of other. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They can easily cover their interest payments. They don't have much debt. ROE is net income over equity. They're at 6%. They have a pretty low ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They have way more than enough current assets to cover their current liabilities. And their current assets are 161 million of cash and 77 million of receivables. It does appear the company has enough money to run its business over the next 12 months without needing to take on more debt. Their free cash flow in a trailing 12 months was $76 million, working capital of $184 million, and they have a $40 million dividend payment. So my calculation is they have $220 million of capital. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Halliburton, Helix, Shawcore, and Secure Energy Services, all in the same industry as Payson. And if Payson has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're worse than all the price multiples, but they're not terrible. They have the highest current ratio of all the companies. ROE, they're better than the average because the average is negative since most companies in this industry have negative earnings. They're really low in debt, the lowest of all the companies. Most of the companies in this industry are really small, except for Halliburton. And even though they cut their dividend, they still pay the highest dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at an 18% premium. I ranked their free cash flow 5 out of 10. It's still positive, which is good, but down 10% from last year. I ranked their revenue 5 out of 10. Everybody's struggling these days, but they're still down a lot, 35% from last year. The ratios are okay, 6 out of 10, and I give their products and brand 5 out of 10. The company is doing a good job at running its business. They're not using much debt or equity, they're able to fund everything on their operational business. Even with lower revenue in the trailing 12 months, they're still able to pay all their expenses. So once their revenue comes back up to where it was in 2018 and 19, they may be able to increase their dividend back up to where it was and invest back into their business to grow it. But this is a really small company. So anytime you invest in a company under 1 billion market cap, I think it's pretty risky. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.